And we'll now turn straight away to Denise Angelo of the School of Literature, Languages and Linguistics at ANU, who will talk about the concept of language ecologies. Over to you, Denise. Thanks, Carmel, and hello, everybody. I'm just sharing my screen, so hopefully that goes quite straightforwardly. Okay, I trust you can see that. Um, yes, I'm presenting. Oh, thanks, Carmel. I'm presenting to you today as part of the ANU team, the research team that provided research for the National Indigenous Languages Report, the so-called Pillar 2. Um, you'll be hearing a little bit more from other um, ANU researchers um, on another component, but I'm going to present to you about the wellbeing and Indigenous languages, <laughs> just a bit of a mouthful, while framework, you can see why we gave it a name, and it's a tool for understanding the links between Indigenous languages and wellbeing. Now, I hope, this is where I'd like to start, I hope you'll all recognise this incredibly famous um, current language tool. Um, it's a widely recognised and iconic image and it has great visual impact and it shows um, with the visual First Nations diversity and it also shows relative locations of many traditional languages. So this is the IATSIS map of Aboriginal Australia. But what it doesn't do is it doesn't give us a holistic picture of contemporary language use. And by that I mean, which are the strong languages and which languages are being reawakened? Um, if they're being reawakened, what are the other languages that are spoken by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? And what we hope is that language ecologists, it might not get quite the iconic status of this map, but it might assist um, policymakers and planners um, with a model of how languages are used in particular places that would overlay the IATSIS map. And while, of course, is about applying language, eco language ecologies to the domain of well-being. Of course, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here in Australia, as well as overseas, have been um, asserting and stating their points of view about how um, their traditional languages uh, benefit their well-being. And we have here two quotes, one from Michael Jarrett, um, who is a Gumbayangir educator and for someone who works um, extremely hard in revitalising and teaching his own language, um, as well as a, um, a quote from a submission from the Walpri Triangle. So communities where Walpri is spoken as four languages um, you know, from birth by children. Now, when um, Michael Jarrett is talking about the um, well-being that he derives from his language, he's talking about Gumbayangir as it is spoken now um, by his language community. Um, he's not saying that it has to be spoken um, fully proficiently, he's talking about the kind of work, hard work that he and his language community are doing and he derives well-being from that. When the Walpuri um, Triangle communities are talking about the well-being that they see derived from um, their um, their traditional language, Walpuri, they see it as it is spoken now, as it's spoken fully by children and all through the community. And it's this um, element where traditional languages and well-being are linked and there's a common ground between all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people on this matter, but it's also that there's nuance um, depending on the context. And that's what we're hoping that language ecologists will capture. So in the language ecologies that we have presented for um, um, uh, for the NILA, um, we have three main language types. Um, and when we say main language types, we mean that these are the ones used predominantly by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, as opposed to languages used by non-Indigenous people. And they are traditional languages like Walpuri that we're just looking at, or Kumbayangi that we're just looking at. And these traditional languages are those languages that are depicted in the IATSIS map. They're the original languages that link to First Nations lands. Some, of course, are strong. As Doug mentioned, that mightn't be the best adjective, but um, um, we know that they're relatively strong because they're learned as first languages from birth, whereas others are in the process of being revived, revitalised or reawakened. We have new languages, again, like Doug mentioned, such as Creole, Yumpla, Talk, Torres Strait Creole, and newly recognised new languages, so doubly new, um, like Yarilingo. Um, these kind of languages are more recent. They come out of um, the processes of language contact and they have historically, um, they have historically um, evidence of fusion of different languages and influences. However, they still have, um, as first languages, an identity factor because we, you know, how we speak um, indicates something about who we are. And of course, some of these new languages are more recognised, such as Creole and Yumpla talk, and others are maybe not, and might even lack a name. And finally, we come to Englishes such as Aboriginal English or Englishes and Torres Strait English. And these are a range of varieties. Some of them are very distant from standard Australian English and some of them are a little bit closer, but they too have an identity factor because how you speak shows where you come from. Even if at a surface level, the way that you use English is quite similar to standard Australian English. 
So when we are talking about the language of colleges vanilla, we have categorized these according to the main language type that dominates in each place. So when we say main type of language, we mean the one that's used most by Indigenous people with each other in that place. And typically, because it's most often used by Indigenous people with each other, is the language that's learned first. It's acquired as the main language from birth. And so we have traditional language ecologies where the traditional language is dominant, a language ecology where the new language is dominant, and a language ecology where English is dominant. And of course, we have a sort of heterogeneous category, often in regional towns or cities, where two or more types are more common. But this research has led to a map, a language ecology map, which you will see in the NILA, which focuses on children. It doesn't include the complex ecologies in towns and cities, and it's like an overlay over the IATSIS map. And you can see where the dots are that that is where traditional languages are commonly spoken as by children as their first language from birth. You can see with the um, slashes that slope to the right, um, this is where everywhere else, um, and you can see what a large part of Australia uh, it covers, traditional languages are spoken as second languages, additional languages, languages that are added over life. And in some places where we've got hatching that sort of leads to cross hatching, these are areas that we have where research shows that new language is spoken by children as first languages. So this then, this picture of language ecologies, then leads to how does this work in with wellbeing? And so here we have the image of the, of the diagram that appears in NILA of WIRE, our wellbeing and Indigenous languages ecologies. And it's got the dimensions of wellbeing in the orange circle here. We've got our language ecologies that we're just talking about in this reddish circle. And we've got the context of use or the reasons uh, that we are using language. And all of these factors interact with how we think about wellbeing. So in the orange circle about wellbeing, um, we have a number of elements which um, the ANU Literature Review um, found in research from here and overseas and in many wellbeing frameworks. We have the language ecologies, which talks about whether or not a language is spoken fully as a first language, or whether it's added additionally to that uh, to your first language and grown over the course of your life. And we have the context of use, the reasons that you're using the language. Are you using it for work? Are you using it because of who you are and your identity? Or are you using it for communication purposes, to access services or to engage with others? Okay, so when we put these together then on the language ecology side, we know that they're important um, for wellbeing and therefore for policy and planning and services um, because they're place-based. So they show nuances and diversity of Indigenous people in Australia. They acknowledge the multiple languages in people's lives and they're classified because of their main, the main language there and what is the first language. So therefore that sort of is a nice little connection between a high frequency language, what's often used, as well as how much we've got and our proficiency. So the main language, traditional new or Englishes, it typically implies what other languages will be added to you. And this obviously impacts on how people feel about using each of these. So if we speak a traditional language, if we're in a traditional language ecology, then this implies pretty strongly that there will be people there who have to learn standard Australian English as an additional language. If we're in a college where English um, or in English is the main or first language, then that implies very strongly that traditional languages will be will be acquired as additional languages. And that depending on how distant that English is from standard Australian English, you might be acquiring that too. And if you're in an ecology where a new language is dominant, then that implies that you'll be adding traditional languages and standard Australian English as additional languages. If we now think about, so that's our language ecology, and think about the context of use, um, the reasons why we're using um, Indigenous languages, identity is an incredibly important part of this story, and that's about who, who people are. Traditional languages um, um, foster identity because of their links with lands and waters, ancestors, community and culture, but our first language is also linked to identity because how we speak reflects who we are. The communicative reason for using language, like engaging with others and accessing services or information, well, typically our first languages are what we speak best, so that's involved. But also if we've got high levels of proficiency in additional language, we could use that as well. 
And finally, in terms of our employment, traditional languages are strongly indicated in um, um, professions such as arts, tourism, rangers and language teaching. But our first language with a standard Australian English is also very useful, for example, in interpreting or other professions like education, childcare, health and community services. And so finally, the ramifications of a language ecology and consequences are, just for example, in a traditional language ecology, then um, interpreting for high stakes interactions in standard Australian English would be a typical consequence. In a language ecology where a new language is dominant, then for example, pathways for naming and recognising that language would be important. And in a language ecology where Englishes are dominant, then reawakening a traditional language is likely to be, you know, a prime focus, which is a long hard, to hoe, long, hard road to hoe. I got the quote wrong. I'm so sorry. Um, and that does imply that we would need um, very strong multi, um, multi prong support. I thank you for that. Thank you, Denise.